This is Political Radar Pulse with Rhonda Sitnikau, where we explore the issues facing Northeast Wisconsin and beyond with insightful interviews and open discussions. Hey, all you political junkies, welcome to Political Radar Pulse, the best 30 minutes of unscripted and uncensored political talk you will hear all day. Back by popular demand. County Supervisors Mark Becker and Paul Ballard. Hello. Hello. Hooray. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you for having again, us back. Again. Thank you. Um, so you're here for a different reason. Um, we're going to talk about something that's on deck. I'm not quite sure what the process is right now, but you have proposed a uh, official ordinance for the county board to adopt to ban the box. Something that 150-ish, I think there might be even more now, uh, cities and counties in the nation have done at this point. Um, 24 states. Oh, there you go. Including uh, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, talk about that. Um, so where did it go? Let me let me just ask you this. Where where did it come from? Um, is this something that people approached you on? Did you feel like it's time to make it official? Do so uh, um, a, a dear friend of mine, um, and someone I grew up with, Rachel Westenberg, um, she works for an organization called Joshua. And... Um, you know, I, I've known her family for all of my life, and she approached me. She said, "Well, you know, we're trying to get this thing done, and, and we're trying to take the criminal checkbox off of the application for employment with Brown County." I didn't even know it was there. I, I knew nothing about this, and so you know, we had lunch. We talked many times, um, and this became something that I kind of thought needed to happen, and so um, yeah, we we proposed a, a resolution. And the day after the resolution was proposed, um, and credit to her, the county human resources director removed that box proactively from the application, which is good and bad because then we had to kind of switch our our approach. But I spoke, uh, you know, and, and worked a lot with her, and so we decided what we would do was instead of make a a, a resolution, we would make it an ordinance because um, for as quickly as she could take it off you know, the next person can come in and put it right back on. So doing it this way um, makes that official county. Where are you at in the process of this, of creating this ordinance? Uh, I mean, it's it's here. So I, I have a copy of what will be proposed. Um, so what will happen is it will go to um, the executive committee. And then from there, it will go to the full county board to vote on. And when is this happening? What's the timeline? Um, it's most likely going to be coming up in October, the October County Board meeting. Okay. And so it's going to what committee first? Uh, executive. Okay. Is that going to be in the September, the October meeting? Do you know? Um, that will be most likely in October. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some of the reasons why this is a good idea. Uh, why so many states and, and counties and cities and you know there there really is a movement right i mean if you look this up on google you can see there's there's a lot happening in regards to this what are some of the reasons why this is actually a good idea um and mark can probably talk more about that moral rationale piece but i mean just from an economic point of view um oftentimes anytime you, you have a barrier on an application whether it is an application fee whether it's a box that someone has to um, check for a criminal record, whatnot, you reduce your applicant pool. And by reducing our applicant pool, we then have less choices to make when we go to, to hire someone. If you have less choices, oftentimes you're paying above market value for that employee. And so you do that enough, and then you have a set of employees that make a lot more than those that were hired behind them. And then eventually you need to equate those people. So it actually is cost, costing the taxpayers more money to have any barrier on the application. Um, by not having this, you're really increasing your amount of qualified, capable, and credentialed employees in your applicant pool. So anytime you increase the applicant pool, you can whittle down to your four, and f four or five top candidates. That's then when you would do your background check. And then, you know, speaking as someone that hires people all the time, and I've had, we don't, you know, my employer does not have a, um, that box. I've gotten to a finalist, saw something um, during their background check, and then I then have to make a decision as a supervisor. Okay, if this person is doing you know, a job where they're just doing processes all day long, 
if they got a drunk driving conviction 15 years ago, does that affect the job that they do today? Um, because can I actually ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm just doing some research. I noticed that the boxes don't have any details, right? It's just check or not check. Blank, yeah. Right. So you really don't know how long the, um, the conviction was mm -hmm. and what the details were. And so for a lot of people, they would just take it and just toss it to the side without any explanation. Yeah. And I don't think anyone would want to be known by the worst thing you've ever done. Um, and I think continuing to bring that up of having to check that box and then explaining it to someone um, time after time and after time when when you kind of go to that hiring piece of, hey, 22 years ago when I was 18, I did this. I'm 40 now. That math doesn't work out. But, <laughs> you know, I'm much older now. It does work out, actually. Um, you know, I'm, I'm older now. This is what I've learned. This is what I've done. This is the credentials I've gotten. You know, and that, and that conviction pushed me to do that. You're able to tell that story. Um, it's much easier to do that when you're the finalist of three than when you're in a pool of 100. So, right. So, and really what you're saying, what we all know to be true is that you have these applications that are in someone's office and they're looking at them and they don't actually go anywhere. Um, you know, you're not looking at the person that is in, that's listed on the application. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the face time even to explain yourself if you have checked that box normally. That's Correct. just. Or even happens. so is if you go in and see that the box is there and you don't want to have to explain yourself because that's something that you've emotionally dealt with. You don't want to have to bring up that own trauma to you of, you of you. yeah, you've put it behind you. I mean, it's okay to do that maybe in a small sense, one-on-one -on -one because you're probably one-on-one. -on -one, you want to sit with a supervisor who you're going to have a relationship with anyway. And if you don't feel comfortable telling that person what your criminal uh, ex experience was, you probably don't want to work for them anyway. Well, and how often does, does someone not check the box even though they have that in their past? I mean, there's really no way to, to right. tell. There's no way to tell. Right. So then what, what are you, I mean, because if we, you know, go through this and you get this um, approved, um, people are still doing background checks when they get through the, the process and they're having interviews. That's the biggest thing that, you know, some of the people that are opposing this say, well, you know, we're never going to know. Yes, we will. What we're doing is allowing that person to sit in front of someone because one of the um, department heads that I spoke with they said that they get an average of 82 applications for every one position that we have open. And so in the past, with the box, they could say, well, you know, we could have the, the best, most qualified resume in our hands, and they would be the best team member. They, they, you know, they, they would fit in really well with, with the county, but they've got the checkbox. So, all right, we got 81 others, so let's just move on. Well, have you found, though, I mean, just – from researching, I've found that it seems like employers are in support of this. That more than not, that seems to be the case. For example, Schreiber took off that box two years ago, mm. so there are you know very big companies in the area. Of course, there are some that that still have that, and it's um, you know like Associated Bank does, which you know I get, um, and it's private business. And this is this is not for private business. This is just for employment with Brown County. And still so there'd still be that box if you're applying for someone that works with children or if you're someone that handles money. I mean, obviously that those are two areas that the conviction piece um, you'd want to talk about beforehand. Mm -hmm. But those are the, when someone's against it, they'll always bring up those two examples. Right. And they said, well, no, it's not a free for all. We're still doing a background check. Um, we want to make sure that Again, the applications increase for that. At one of the uh, at our committee meeting, because I'm on I'm on uh, administration, and we spoke a little bit about this. And, and there was a um, an elected department head came and spoke as a private citizen, and um, you know said things like, "Well, I, you know, we handle money. I, I can't I can't hire someone with uh, that that's been convicted of writing a bad check." And then I said, "So don't." Right. You know, so, hello. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 not that hard. It's it. No, 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 nothing's going to be hidden. You're not We're tying their hands at all. You're right. just removing no, something not at all. Right. Right. And, and because 24 states have done this, and 150 cities have done it, and private industries have done it for a while, there are some studies that have looked at this. And so, a 2016 study done by the Brookings Institute looked at this. 
Um, and there was an increase in employment um, from individuals that had criminal records. Um, there was lower turnover in positions. But they did find that undereducated, so people that have less than a high school diploma that were African-American and Hispanic males, were, were greatly affected by Ban the Box because employers or the hiring agents were making assumptions on that. Well, anytime in social science when someone does a study, and this study was done in New York and New Jersey, people like to replicate it because it's just a time and a place. That might only be true for New York and New Jersey in private industries. So they replicated the study in Durham, North Carolina. They did it in Atlanta, Georgia. They did it in San Francisco, California, and didn't find that at all. And actually what they found is actually more of an increase in employment rate for those that had criminal uh, convictions and uh, a, um, a, another re reduction in the turnover rate. And again, this, they just only looked at the private sector. So those that against will bring up the, this is going to greatly affect African-American males and Hispanic males. Yep, in private sectors in New York and New Jersey's for those that have less than a high school diploma. A 2017 just, uh, study that just came out that this uh, researcher only looked at the public sector. And so these are just the cities and the states that had that. And she found the same things, higher employment rate, less unemployment rate overall in the states and the cities that did that, and a reduction in the turnover rate. And I think that's what we're really looking for with this is we often hear so many times in Brown County the turnover rates that we have for a lot of positions, the lack of applications that we have. Um, you know, we talk about building a new jail pod. Well, I mean, a lot of times if people can't get them employed, that's the pressure to then commit another crime. Um, you have that, you know, pressure, you know, for crimes that are not of passion. So, you know, money crimes, other stealing is, you know, you have pressure. You have an opportunity and you have a justification of, I need to, to live, I need my family to eat. And then, you know, that's well, and, the case. And for on every that place. note, there are, I mean, there's a huge possibility that these people are on public assistance. So if you are an opponent of, of this ordinance, then you are, you're not really looking to reduce that on tax burden or taxpayer burden, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's an argument. I, I don't understand how they don't see that. I, I, you know, and what I like about this issue is this spans political boundaries, right? So, I mean, this is something that a lot of the, you know, more liberal people on our county board say, yes, this is great. But this was also greatly supported by one of the most conservative governors in the country. Scott Walker signed this into law. And if you look at the assembly bill and some of the people who, this was sponsored by Jim Steinecke, who's a big fan of him. Um, Clayfish, uh, Ott, John Nigren, Senator Roth, Wangard, Fitzgerald, Senator Lassay. So, I mean, these, these are people that, I mean, it, this, this is something that everyone can agree with. Can I ask you a question, though? What does this state exactly? So this From states, the state level. Um, section 3 says, unless a certain conviction record disqualifies applicants from a civil service position, this bill prohibits the director of the bureau from asking an applicant on an application or otherwise to supply information about the applicant's conviction record before the applicant is certified for the position. So in essence, what it says is until that person is the number one choice and we want to hire you, they can't, they can't talk about it. They can't, they can't ask about it unless it's, you know, because it exempts law enforcement. It exempts um, people that have direct personal care, like if you want to work for Brown County uh, Mental Health that they have different standards. If you want to work for the Brown County Sheriff's Department, their standards are way more stringent, which as they should be, right? So that's that's what this does. This was passed into law February 2016. So what you're doing now, um, compare that because people might, might ask that question. What is it doing in regards to this? Is it just like another stamp of yes or? Well, because so what they did with the state is it's employment with the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same darn thing, employment with Brown County. So they're setting a precedent, really. Yeah. And it's been set by many, many you know, different businesses and, and, and governments from state down to, um, you know, down, down to municipal. What is, I don't, I mean, I've seen it, on, but I don't remember what it says. What does it say? Does it say that you've ever been arrested or convicted? Have you ever been convicted of a crime? So convicted. So it doesn't just say arrested? Because an arrest isn't necessarily a conviction. Um, it depends on your applications. I, you know, oh. not 
Our application just says convicted. I have seen applications. Yeah, I feel like uh, I've seen arrest. Convicted, mm-hmm. arrested. Like, have you pleaded no contest? Please explain. I mean, and, and, and explain that. But, I mean, I've worked in the education sector all my life, so those would be a place that you'd want to make sure that those are because you're dealing with children. But that is, um, But that would be something that's still in place for that. Are there any other arguments out there that you're hearing against, you know, putting this through? Some of them say that um, <clears throat> a, a very common one is we're giving applicants false hope. They're applying for a position they're not qualified for. So, for example, if you wrote a bad check, you can't get a job in the treasurer's office. And so my counter argument to that is that would be like me applying for a position, like, like with, as a professor at St. Norbert. I, I can't do that. So if someone's giving somebody a false hope, that's myself thinking that I'm qualified to, to teach at a, at a at a university. But isn't that your freedom to do that? It it mm. is. And so, you know, it's that's that's a non argument. But really. if a person is credential and qualified to do that job, what means well, does that conviction take away from that? Right. I mean, if you're you know, if you're a drug counselor, obviously you can't get credentialed if you have a drug conviction. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those are a lot of times those are the people that do the best work because they have the most empathy and understanding and they have a success story to share with, Mm -hmm. especially when we think about Brown County. Right. I mean, those are the people that are typically in that position because that's. You know that's what they want to do, and one of the qualifications of that is that credential. And the state so or the state or national association won't credential you because you've had that condi- condi- that conviction. So oh, okay, <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean, the, that's a different episode. The, of. Wow. The biggest thing here is this is not a big deal. I mean, this is this is something that is not a huge change. It's not groundbreaking, but it 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 has a big effect, and it's a positive one. And so for the people that say, oh my gosh, we're going to have, you know, all these felons running around. No, we're not. One in four people have to check that box in Brown County. Okay. So you take 82 applications. I mean, the math, I mean, that, that's a lot of people that would have to check that box for that one position. But who knows? One of those people might be the best applicant there. So if you shoplifted when you were 20 years old, 21 years old. Got to check the box. Got to check the box. You're 35 years old now and you're applying for a job. And you have to check the box because you shoplifted when you were 21 You got into old. a bar fight when you were 22 and, you know, dumb. Mm-hmm. You got to check the box because, you you know, dis- disorderly conduct or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So what is your, I guess, if you had to speculate on the support for this? I, I would think that it's pretty far reaching. I I heard some vote counts that I think that were on the positive side of that. It's still early. I never like to mm-hmm. count before my chickens are hatched, but I, I think we have good support, as Mark said, both from those of a, those that are more progressive than those who are more conservative, because you can make the moral argument for this. I mean, um, I was raised a Methodist, and that has been in the literature that we've been receiving for over a decade. You can make the economic argument for it because it reduces unemployment, it reduces turnover, and you have more applications. Um, there's lots of pieces in that. But if even if we do get this removed from the application, there's more work to be done. I think we need to do a lot of training with the hiring agents to talk about implicit bias. Um, just because assuming of someone's race or what their address is doesn't mean that they could have a, a a conviction on their record. And that's what that study that a lot of people are going to cite of it disadvantages those folks. Well, okay. And if we think that it, do, it does, that means that we need to do better. We shouldn't have that box just because we're not good at being, or we're very good at being biased or we're not good at being um, more open to all applications. So we need to probably do some training at the county level of reducing that implicit bias. You talk about um, religious leaders. I do want to read just a little bit. Um, there was a, a letter to the editor that came out. This was on Sunday. and uh, So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says, um, as religious leaders ministering in several faith communities in the county, and they're talking to county supervisors, we want you to know that we feel the box is unjust and counterproductive. For too many, the box amounts to a second sentence of a past crime. The box makes it nearly impossible to get a job as employers automatically discard the applicant from the pool of applicants. Banning the box does not mean people can hide their records. It simply moves that discussion later in the process, giving the applicant an opportunity to discuss the situation from, uh, with the potential employers. Our faith moves us to work for justice, 
a justice that reintegrates past offenders into the community and supports and facilitates their living full and productive lives. Banning the box doesn't guarantee a job, but it helps remove the op an obstacle in the application process that we don't need to be there. And this is from I mean, Reverend Luke from First United, Father Bill Hoffman, Judy from uh, Joshua Leadership Team, Father Paul, a Catholic priest who's He's my man. He's awesome. <laughs> uh, Pastor Marion from the Moravian uh, Parish, Bob Cabot, Ma St. Matthews. I mean, this is from all sorts of denominations. My mom's wonderful coworker, Sheila DeLuca, who's the pastoral associate at Res, um, United Congregational. I mean, I mean this. I mean, so that's a big deal to get all those people together to 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 support this from all different walks of life and all different uh, faiths. So these people are not afraid to give someone hope, right? Okay. What is wrong with giving someone hope? That's what I'd like to know. Like that was an argument, right? Against mm -hmm. this? Yep. Giving false hope. What is wrong with giving someone hope? Yeah. I mean, even being called in for an interview is give some people confidence. Yeah, of, right. yeah. Isn't this what we want to do as, as leaders in, in local right. government? This is what we want to do. I, I want to talk. So just process wise. So with no box there, what happens is, and, and you've hired people, I, you know, I've been part of uh, hiring as well in, in my employer, who my opinions are my own, so just FYI, a little disclaimer, <laughs> forgot to do that at the beginning. Uh, so what happens is you have a, a job opening, and you bring people in for an interview with no, hopefully, no predisposition, no bias, um, and you narrow it down to your top three, four, five people. Um, so then from those, that handful of people, you pick the applicant that you want to hire, uh, you transition that over to our human resources, which by the way, our human resources director was trained by the FBI on how to do background checks, so she's pretty good at it. Um, so she does the background check. At that point, um, if it's good, you're good to go. If it's not and you found something that is a disqualification, um, guess what? You have three, four, five different applicants that you can then choose from. So you talk about wasting time. If you're following normal hiring practices and normal hiring um, procedures, you're fine because you have the top candidates. You're still narrowing them down. Right. Like you, you always just have move been. on to the next one. Right. So, yeah. And, and one of the reasons I'm a fan of the ordinance, you know, <clears throat> in addition to reducing unemployment and reducing the turnover rate is I want to make sure that it, it, it is an ordinance so that we can't go back. Mm -hmm. Though there's not a direct correlation one of the things I do is I study higher education and what happens there. And there's lots of studies there on colleges that have put the box on their application just to reduce the crime rate on their, um, on their college campuses. And the original thought by putting that on there, much like the Brookings Institute study, would it really in, it would be a barrier to um, males of color in applying to college. And in reality, it has actually reduced the number of Caucasian or white males applying to different colleges. So a lot of colleges that had normally put that, had put that on, had then taken that off. Not a direct correlation, but kind of see of, hey, this is an, you know, a free application that you can put in to get into a college. And I think it is a, kind of a, a good idea if this box does go back on in the county in the future, that we are gonna in fact reduce applications, which is what we, the opposite of what we want. Are there any, sorry, are there any statistics out there for opponents of this, of moving this forward? Are, are they citing any sort of data, statistics, yeah, anything was, at all? It was that study that, you know, Supervisor Dr. Paul Ballard uh, <laughs> referenced that was debunked twice. Three times. Three times, excuse me, three <laughs> times. Okay, so. And it was only, and that was study, and that's, <laughs> that's the thing of any study. It's that time and place. So yeah. that was New York, New Jersey, private companies, you know, and that's what they found. And then when they replicated that study three times, they didn't find that. Well, what, what I think is so funny. It could have just been an aberration of that mm -hmm. time and place when right. that person did the study. There are there are people that will say, oh, my gosh, you know, we had, I feel like the guy from um, the Manitowoc Minute, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, that, um, Not like, familiar with no, that. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, like, uh, they'll, they'll cite people that stole from the zoo or they would say, uh, this person stole from the county treasurer's office in BFE, California, and all that kind of stuff. But those are the people that didn't have to check the box to begin with. So, you know, yes, things will happen. But as the study said three times, the, the positives that come from this, enriching our communities, giving hope, giving jobs to people that 
that do need it. I, I've been on the county board for a year and a half, and so many times we talk about giving people chances, um, giving someone a second chance, giving them opportunity. We spend millions of dollars um, trying to, you know, uh, uh, reintegrate people with that have uh, mental health issues, drug crimes. We have our opiate court. So this just takes it one step further. We're gonna we're gonna mean what we say when we talk about giving people a second chance. We are and 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 we're going to and for Supervisor Evans who is so against this. Supervisor Pat Evans. Supervisor <laughs> Pat Evans who is so against this. You know he was the one that that was the champion of of the mental health initiative. Dude, come on board, man. This this is something that is common sense. Well, it's a collective, really. I mean, you can't have this part of it, and then you can't That's be a, doing this part of it. You're exactly right. This is one step in in that whole discussion of how do we give people a second chance? How do we bring people back into our communities? And like you say, I mean, what would we rather have them on? You know, assistance programs or or give them a job. Well, and you right? can't you can't be championing the mantra of get to work, get to work, lazy, get to work, deadbeat. You you can't be on yes. both sides. You have to pick a lane in this. Yeah. Really, plus two is we as supervisors have a fiduciary responsibility to our taxpayers. And one of the things when I came on the county board and I kept on seeing the minutes of turnover rates and I would read the minutes and my eyes were just, you know, open of like, it's crazy. of like how many turnover, you know, how much we have positions turn over. That costs the taxpayers a lot of money to post, interview, train a new employee if they're only staying for less than a year. Yes. And that's one of the pieces that, that really popped to me of these, di these five different studies that have looked at this is that reduction in turnover rate. That's what we want to do. So are, you, are you hearing from the people that actually do the hiring at the county level? Um, I've heard from two that are against it. And, and what are their reasons? Um, one of the reasons was that I don't want to hire people that are convicted of uh, financial crime because um, we handle money in this office. And so it's like, okay, so don't. So don't hire that so person hire for that, person. that position. Okay. Um, the other one said uh, that they, they don't want to give someone false hope. And there is someone um, who spoke in front of a, the, the, he's the clerk of courts, and he spoke in front of the protection committee or whatever it was, and I've tried to call him like four times. And he won't return my calls, and and it's very petty. Um, Who is that? That uh, this John Vanderlees Jr. Okay, and he so he's against it. Yes. Be okay. Well, it, you know, he's the clerk of court, so he's trying to, you know, I don't want these, you know, criminals in my in my in my department. Is there like some sort of herd of criminals that's <laughs> being harbored somewhere? I haven't seen them. that are going to be released <laughs> as soon as you you know well, get and, this and passed. Here's like, the I'm thing. So confused. Here's the thing. Ultimately, they are in charge of hiring for their department. If you are uncomfortable with hiring someone, don't hire them. Right? Right. Period. So, I mean, and, and in every single one um, and in every single conversation that I've had it, with with those two people, and I'm sure that if the third person would pick up his flipping phone, that's the conversation. If you don't want to hire someone, don't hire them. So they they assume you're taking the control out of of, of their job and what right. their job is to do. They're you're not. I talked to Sheriff Gossage, and he said he you know because if someone said oh sheriff is dead set against it, and I called him and he said I'm not against it. I I'm I'm exempt from it. So uh, you know what what do we have? But I will say, human resources is for this. Mm -hmm. um, and are, they have a lot of workload if this goes through, correct? Mm -hmm. They got a vested interest, right? Our corporation council is for this because he says that one thing that it will do is it could reduce um, lawsuits because having that app, that checkbox in the application could, um, could open us up to lawsuits in regards to you're discriminating against me because mm -hmm. of my drunk driving I had when I was 21 years old. So, I mean... And you look at most crimes of fraud. Crimes of fraud are done because there's pressure, yeah. there's opportunity, and there's justification. And those, so you have those people that steal, like the reference of, like, yes, in this organization in California, or the church secretary that was skimming off the ties. I mean, those are long, I mean, that happened because they felt pressure for something, they had the opportunity to steal the money, and then they justify it in some way. A person is not going to play the long game of, 
hmm, if I get this job okay. in the treasurer's <laughs> office, uh, seven years from now, I might be able to steal something <laughs> because you've removed that pressure. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. I mean, that justification for me is just, I, it's an eye roll for me. Yes. And I, I would say that the majority of, of department heads that I've talked to are for this. Okay. Well, um, Good. thanks for coming Good. on again, boys. <laughs> uh, that went fast. Uh, any last thoughts? I'm going to wrap up. If this is a big deal and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic in terms of the results of this, but one of the reasons why I think so many of um, some, these type of issues do pass like our, our mining thing is because the supervisors heard from their constituents. They heard from the community. So if you guys out there agree with this, get in touch with your supervisors send emails, call us, show up when this is going to be discussed because, you know, it's really, really hard for us to say no to our constituents. Mm -hmm. And if they show up in a big way and speak about this and um, make their opinion heard, uh, you know. Sooner than later. Obviously. Sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is, this is a big deal. And the work to reduce the unemployment rate in the county and reduce the number of people in front of heroin court and the other yes. drunk court. I mean, that's this is just a piece of that, but our work is not done. This right. is you know, really, you're, you're kind of, this is a humanity type of situation. Yes. You're, you're really and truly trying to elevate people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I mean, for those that don't shouldn't be hired, the gate is still up. Mm -hmm. For those that should, we're reducing some barriers for them, as we should. That's mm -hmm. our role as government officials, is to make people's lives better. I mean, that's what we are supposed to, you know, change structures and processes to improve the lives of people. I'm going to end on that because that's a really great thought. Um, thanks again, uh, Mark and Paul, for coming on. For show notes, go to politicalradarpulse.com slash 21. If you're watching this episode on YouTube, like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications for more great political content. Check out Political Radar Echo. If you'd like to support the show, you can like the show on Facebook, join the Political Radar Echo community group on Facebook, and you can buy shirts and other merchandise at politicalradar.com slash shop. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for watching Political Radar Pulse. To ensure that you'll never miss an episode, subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. To check out more episodes of Political Radar Pulse, visit politicalradarpulse.com or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter.